my goodness. Okay. So, hello everybody. Um, yeah, we <laughs> have a lot of snow and it's really, really cold and my ducks don't like it at all and I don't really like it. I like snow and, and I like winter. I just like it better when it's not below freezing for like three weeks in a row. So <laughs> this is not my kind of wintry weather, but um, on top of all of that, I managed to once again hurt my back because well, I didn't have like, I don't have a family history of you know, like fabulous backs. My grandmother had scoliosis and my dad has back problems and uh, yeah, when I was pregnant with Ina, she decided it would be really fun to sit on my sciatic nerve on the right side and my hips just like, mm. yeah. So um, I threw my back out again. It's been really painful for the last like three days and really fun because we have basically a blizzard right now and I'm in a lot of pain but I still have to go to the animals, so it's just not very fun. And, and I'm in so much pain that I'm just like not doing much except knitting. So um, I, do have, I do have my sweater pretty far along, which I, I thought was pretty good, right? I'm in my second ball of yarn. I'm still only in the second ball of yarn. I have both sleeves and the neckband done and, and I have the body pretty well started. And, uh, and I tried it on last night and it's fitting decently. Um, it'll fit better once it's been, you know, fully blocked and all that good stuff. Oh yeah, let's not drop. There we go. Not drop stitches. Um, but yeah, so I'm still in the second ball of hand spun. And I'm very pleased with that, that I'm still in my second ball of hand spun. Um, and it's coming along. It's coming along really nice. And so since my back hurts, I'm kind of just like eating my ibuprofen and warming up my heat pack and knitting on my sweater, but not, not looking too shabby. And I did do three quarter sleeves because, um, I tend to wear those more and especially on a pullover. I, I like long sleeves and a cardigan, but I like three quarter sleeves and a pullover. It's really weird. I don't know. It's really weird. And oh yeah. Um, yes, it's, I, so, you know, Amy, it's that fingering weight yarn. I had like 460 yards in the first ball and 480 yards in the second ball. So that's, uh, oh gosh, like 900 yards, um, 920 yards, I think something like that. Anyway, it's, it's a ton of yardage really. Um, so yeah, I'm still working through and I have a good chunk of the second ball still, um, there's not quite as much here as it looks because I did, like I took the whole center out because I made the sleeves and um, because of the color progression, I had to do one from the outside in and one from the inside out. So anyway, but I still have this much. So I'm just gonna keep working my way through this. And once I um, finish up with that turquoise and I have this beautiful orange, this beautiful soft um, peanutty orange that's going to go on the bottom and Right now, the plan is a little longer sweater, especially because I have a long torso, so I need more sweater. And then um, I'm going to like put side slits in and maybe a little lace along the bottom, um, or maybe just some lace along the bottom. I haven't fully decided on that, but something that gives, because I do have some hips, give it a little more room down there. Um, and I'm, you know, kind of designing as I go, so I have to write it all down. And yeah, Manitowoc, I'm sure, is freezing, Bev. Um, but yeah, I like, I am so, I am, I am so over, so over this cold. And this, like, disgusting, hasn't been above freezing for two weeks. I'm over it. I'm telling you, I'm so over it. And I think I have, like, another full week of this still where we are not yet above freezing. And I am just... I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of it. And yes, Amy, that is the plan to put some lace in that sweater. Right now, that's the plan. 
So, and no, I don't have a chair massage, Beverly. In fact, I was supposed to have a massage tomorrow night, but I called and canceled because we are supposed to get something like six inches, six to 10 inches of snow, like today through tonight, on top of what we already had. And I'm by St. Louis, so we're kind of equipped for like ice and snow, but not that much ice and snow. So yeah, that's not so fun. Anyway, so kind of get back on track. Sorry, the pain, you know, is just not mm, making me think very well. So anyway, um, I keep hoping that my back will be better. I keep trying, like I'm doing the heat pack and I'm trying to be really good and I'm taking my ibuprofen and I tried Tylenol this morning because I thought maybe I have some inflammation, that's a problem. No, no, I'm pretty sure I pinched a nerve on the left side this time instead of the right side. <sighs> And my back and hips are just really unhappy about that. But anyway, um, today, uh, if you haven't joined in on our Crafters Year of Self-Care, Needle Crafters Year of Self-Care, don't forget to do that. We're halfway through the month, which means, you know, we're halfway to picking another prize winner. And all you have to do is post a photo or a video on social media, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, uh, Instagram, whatever, and tag Black Sheep Fiber Emporium so we can find you. Uh, and just tell us that you're doing Crafters Year of Self-Care. We have all the info up on the website. Remember, this month is all about um, treating yourself with little luxuries, whatever you, you know, think that is. And um, I said, buy a luxurious fiber. But we're also working on projects, right? So I have my hand-spun, hand-knit sweater here that I'm working on, which is done in blue face luster and silk, silk is my um, is my uh, luxurious fiber for the month. And um, I have some other stuff that I wanna do, I just haven't managed to get to it. <laughs> Cause the sweater, it's amazing, the sweater takes a lot of time. Um, anyway, and yeah, yeah. Oh, back problems, man, back problems, yeah. Oh. Amy, you know your Gansey totally counts for like crafters or your self-care. And there's no reason that you can't just say, hey, I'm doing my self-care and I'm making myself a sweater and like just tag us and you're good to go. And you're totally in. And tell your friends too. Like we tried to make this super inclusive and really easy and there's not like strict, um, strict monthly things. We have some loose guidelines, but so long as you're like tagging Black Sheep Fiber Emporium and you say, hey, this is for your self-care. It counts, totally counts. And you can enter like 10 times if you want to. We don't care. You can like, you can enter every day. You can enter two or three times a day. Um, every entry counts because we're just trying to spread the word about uh, the year of self-care and like having fun with our crafting and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, last week I thought it would be really fun to do um, kind of a series of um, histories of lace on Mondays. And then of course we're going to be doing weaving Wednesdays for a little while. And um, so I went to the internet, and I have my I have my laptop here, but I went to the internet and I looked up some fun stuff. And there's actually um, a book on Project Gutenberg that's by Samuel Goldenberg called um, Lace, Its or Origin and History. And, um, you know, it was interesting. It's from 1904, and there's a really hideous picture of a woman at the beginning of it um but uh he had some interesting little additions to um like the uh origins of lace that i hadn't seen before this is uh the book that i really like it's called the identification of lace it's by pat earnshaw and she has some really entertaining stuff so i thought i would share some of that um, from the beginning and if you're really into bobbin lace, um, especially if you're into collecting or learning about bobbin lace uh, This is a cool little publication. It's called lace a quick guide to identification and we have had this in stock I'm not sure if we have more of it right now, but maybe Tina can tell us um, But this is a really cool little book because it gives you close-ups of um, both handmade uh, so that's the top and machine made so that you can get a better idea of the differences and it lists those out. And I thought, oh, this is a really cool little publication. It's kind of a nice like 
field guide to lace if you happen to really like lace or antiquing, and I do love lace and antiquing, and you're out and about. This is a nice little book to haul along because it helps you to identify uh, whether a piece of lace has been machine made or handmade, at least a little faster. Um, and then of course I talked about Iowa Lie last time. This happens to be the latest bulletin that just came out. Um, and it does feature the lace collar for Ruth Bader Ginsburg that was designed by, um, is it Elena? Hang on, I'm gonna say her name wrong unless I, I look for it in here. What is this gal's name? Uh, not Leah Baumeister. Um, and there's some good stuff in here. Elena Kennedy Lou from New York. And she's on TikTok as well. So if you're looking for her, she's on TikTok. Um, but she is this gal down here and she does a lot of contemporary lace. Um, and she helped to uh, design and create this cool collar. Um, that was presented to uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, let's see. To celebrate the 25th anniversary of her investiture to the Supreme Court. So, um, you know, Iowa Lies kind of got some fun stuff in their bulletin. So if you love lace, you know, even if you aren't a bobbin lacer, there's some, like, really interesting stuff in here. And I mean, I admit, I do tat and Mediterranean knotted lace. And of course knitted lace so you know i have a little bit of an investment in iowa lie but um anyway let me get started so really interesting stuff here um until like the like 1500s there really isn't anything that we know as lace like that's a pretty um, that's what i want that's a pretty accepted it's a pretty accepted thing is that until you get to the 1500s there isn't really anything that we know as lace there's tapes and there's embroideries and um there's a lot of woven goods but you don't really see lace and when lace first arises you see it as a needle lace and um the needle laces that you uh, are presented with are um one of two kinds where either it's drawn thread hey cheryl it's either drawn thread where they're pulling threads out of a piece of fabric and then they are embroidering over it um to open things up and i think that's reticella um which hopefully if betty's on here she'll correct me if i got that wrong um betty is my friend from the lafayette lace makers who was supposed to join um me and and like watch me today and make sure that i get this right but hopefully she's here um Anyway, so you start with needle laces because you have um, embroidery. So it's, you know, kind of starts with embroidery and with needle laces. And you have, um, what is it, punta de aria and all these puntas, right? Point, point laces um, that come out of Italy. And also, um, let's see, it was Italy and, um, let's see, Point de Venice. What was the other one? Uh, Italy and um, let's see oh there we go drawn thread work punta terrato cut work where um, holes are cut in the material and embroidered around which is punto tagliato and you see them in France and Spain and um, in Italy and like you don't really know exactly which country it was that first started lace and um yeah anyway uh nobody really cares it doesn't really matter exactly where it started but lace then bobbin lace um arises sometime after we start with our needle laces and these drawn thread works and it's done in imitation of them so the first bobbin laces that you see are very geometric and they're following the same design styles as the needle laces and the drawn thread works because they are trying to mimic them. So we get into a lot of mimicry here with bobbin lace. Um, and it's interesting because then our later laces mimic the bobbin laces as well. So fun stuff. Um, well, yeah, reenactor nerds. I don't really care if it was Italy or France. It doesn't matter. Um, in the long run, all that matters is that we have lovely lace. So, um, anyway, so 
Punto and Aria, by, by the way, is like stitches in air. And um, eventually from Punto and Aria, you get bobbin lace and that arises as um, a weaving technique, but it's a weaving technique without having to have a loom. And instead of having a big frame and heddles, like we talk about with my rigid heddle downstairs, you end up using pins as kind of both the frame and the heddles for your loom. And so it gives you a lot more leeway because you can turn corners a lot faster. You can suddenly make tape laces and you can connect things and you can turn corners um, and curves that you couldn't do before on a loom. And um, just kind of really like interesting shapes and beautiful shapes, right? So um, let's see. Do, 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 do. I was gonna read you part of this, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't mark it. I should have marked it. Um, so this is this really like blew my mind here. But when they're working this original lace, the uh, Punto Anaria, um, their superb quality was fully appreciated by the nobility of the period, who valued them at their true worth more highly than jewels or silks. Knowing the endless hours of slow, painstaking labor in highly uncomfortable cow buyers, cow buyers, where the moist warmth emanating from the cows below, if you've ever been around cows, you know they're quite steamy in the winter, uh, kept the fine flax thread supple and the hands of the lace makers from becoming stiff with cold. Some workers made only 24 inches in a whole year. 24 inches in a year, that's two feet of lace in a year. And as many as 1,200 bobbins might be needed to make a wide flounce, which would progress at no more than an inch a day. I mean, 1,200 bobbins and an inch a day. I can't imagine that. Can you imagine that? And this is um, somewhere 1650 to 1700 is when they're talking about this. Um, just like crazy. Just craziness. Uh, craziness. And... Um, Bobbin lace is faster to make than needlepoint lace, which is why bobbin lace overtakes needlepoint lace as we move from the 1500s or the 16th century into the 1600s and the 1700s. And um, for your early 17th century, most of your bobbin lace is made in Northern Europe. So it's made in Flanders um, or in Southern Europe and uh, Venice. And then by the time you get to like the 1650s or the 1700s, you start to see a lot of different places are making it. And you'll, there are a ton of different um, lace traditions that are all kind of named after the place that they originated. So there's like uh, Chantilly and Mechlin and um, Bunch, not Binch, like I always thought it was, because that's what it looks like to me, but Bunch. And um, what's the other one that, uh, and it's not Chantilly, I said Chantilly. It's not Chantilly lace, Chantilly which I always thought was entertaining. Uh, what else is there? And then of course there's all the English laces, laces that actually arise later than that. And um, Flemish lace of course was like highly prized and um, there are all of these different acts that are um, enacted to prevent the importation of lace because lace becomes such a huge commodity that people want just like yards and yards of it. And the only way that you can show your wealth and your status is in wearing lace. It's not in wearing jewels, it's in wearing lace. Lace, right? Because this is how highly prized it is. And um, at the beginning of uh, the 1700s, you get your period of frills where you have lace on everything. I'm not talking a little bit of lace, I'm talking like yards and yards of lace. Uh, on anything that you could think to put it on, especially anywhere that you would exhibit it. So anywhere around the face and the hands, you would be exhibiting a lot of lace, your handkerchief, your fans, anywhere that you were exhibiting a ton of lace. Uh, that's where you start to see it at the beginning of the 1700s. And um, <laughs> it's really entertaining because in Pat Ernst's book, she says pickpockets and other thieves went for lace rather than jewels since... Many of the 18th century jewels were made of paste. Hmm, didn't know that. While the fabulous handmade laces were of enormous value and much coveted. 
Thieves were known to slit open the leather backs of hack coaches and take the lady's head. But this was less alarming than it sounds, for the term referred to the wig, with its lacy superstructure of fontange and lappets. Um, in an effort to stamp out this crime, the police requested all ladies to sit in the carriages with their backs to the horses. Um, lace becomes a form of currency. Lace um, gets, like, smuggled. And um, so, like, the late 1700s, lace is suddenly so highly prized and such a status symbol. And um, you, the other thing is, like, these little lace centers, they don't really spread their knowledge of laces. Um, because, of course, you want to keep your technology to yourself because you want people to buy it from you, not somebody else. And so um, there's, like, smuggling of knowledge that goes on. And... Um, there's also something that happens um, that we don't exactly know why, but during that um, like 1700s period of time, the flax that is produced in Northern Europe is the finest flax and makes the finest thread that we are able to produce at any point in time. And, and it's all hand, like hand spun at this point, right? Still hand spun. We still don't have spinning machines. And um, they don't know if it was exactly the climate. They don't know if the, oh, there's been climate change. They don't know if it was like a subspecies of flax that has died out because flax is an annual um, product. It's, it's kind of like a grass where you plant your seeds, it comes up and it's a, a thin, um, it's a very, very thin plant that looks sort of like a reed. It blooms a really little flower. Um, produces flax seed and then you know dies but um, and then you ret the reeds and it's the thin fibers within which makes linen so flax and linen are the same plant it's just that linen is the product and flax is the plant um, anyway so this is the time period during which like lace flourishes it's the most uh, expensive it's the finest it is um, you know, sought after it's smuggled. And she's got some great little like smuggling stories in here that I wanted to share. Um, but you also see that lace during this time period of that like late 1600s into the like 1750s, um, it, you see a lot of taxation, you see a lot of um, rules and laws being made, sumptuary laws about what you can and cannot wear and how much you can and cannot wear. And, um, yeah, so entertaining. Um, but because of the various acts prohibiting the importation of foreign laces, especially the needle points of France, Spain, and Venice, smuggling is rife. So um, you would have your, uh, what's the word I want? Um, it's not a count, it's your tax tax people, your tax people <laughs> that would go around and they would um, raid like tailors and your home and anywhere that they thought that lace was being imported and smuggled and they would confiscate and burn the lace. And so we've lost a lot of that lace, that beautiful lace, the, the hundreds of hours of work because of these uh, sumptuary laws and these laws against importation because the lace was destroyed um, sort of like, you know, burning banned books. So you lose those books because they're destroyed and you don't ever get to see them. Um, oh, yeah, let's see. Where was the one that... Uh, so attempts to smuggle lace uh, continue and you'll find lace that's hidden in like loaves of bread that people will put them in turbans. They'll hide lace in books. Um, they'll wrap it around babies, they'll put lace in umbrellas, um, they'll put lace in coffins, and she even mentions, um, uh, the coffin of the Bishop of Atterbury, brought home from France, contained with the corpse 6,000 pounds worth of French lace. That's 6,000 pounds worth in the time period. So, that's a lot more money in this time. Um... And then there, at times, like, people would even send home coffins and they would just put the head and the feet in the coffin and then they would make, like, a sackcloth body 
that had late that was stuffed with lace to try to smuggle it through. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, people are always inventive, but you know, they're doing this, this with lace. They're doing this with bobbin lace. Um, because they're, they're so frantic to bring it in that, uh, you know, and to prove how like worthy they are that they're smuggling it in. They're smuggling lace in any way that they can think of. Um, anyway, but as we move then into like the late 1700s, the early 1800s, then lace is no longer, um, highly desired. You don't have, you know, the giant collars of the, uh, late 1500s. We don't have the simple wide collars of the early 1600s. We've lost the lappets, the fontages. Um, you aren't carrying enormous, like beautifully lace um, bedecked handkerchiefs. And lace uh, is kind of relegated to the wayside. And in fact, people start to like throw it away. They burn it. They give it to the servants, you know, as they move into the 1800s because you get very simple classic lines. Um, and and your fabric no longer becomes as uh, sumptuous sumptuary laws sumptuous right so um you lose a lot of the um this beautiful lace this really fine lace because it gets cut up it gets burned it gets tossed out and um there are revivals later into the 1850s and the 1900s where people try to bring lace back especially in england um, with Buckham, Buckingham, Bucking, Bucks Point, Bucks Point, um, Bedfordshire, um, what are some of the other English laces? I can't think of them right now, but those are the two that I, I always remember the most are Bucks Point and Bedfordshire. Um, and there are some other ones, but, um, I was trying to see if I had the, I had my list there. Honiton, Honiton's another one, um, Midlands. So there are, there's a lot of different lace, um, groups that start then in England to try to um, sort of shore up the dying, declining industry. And then eventually you move into like the 1900s where bobbin lace essentially just becomes the purview of um, the hobbyist. It's not a way to make money anymore. It's not something that you do for a living. Um, although there are, you know, always exceptions to that where if you are, um, exceptionally into bobbin lace, then you can find a way to uh, make a career of it. But it's not the lace making itself. It's usually in pattern design um, or as a vendor or um, as a teacher that you make your career in lace now. But at one point, at one point, like lace was worth so much that, um, where was it? Mm, yeah. Charles I is known to have spent a thousand pounds in 1625 on his personal lace and linen and a 1500 pounds in 1633. And that was like in 1633 currency. That's a lot more money today. It's like a lot more money today. Um, it's just kind of like, it's fascinating. It's always fascinating. One, I love history. And, and I picked this up for cheap, but, and this is an old book. I don't even think it's in print anymore, but it's a really fun book. I love picking up history books like this. I find the history of lace to be really interesting. And I wanted to give you kind of the brief er overview of bobbin lace today. And then next week we're going to do bobbin lace, but I'm going to show you examples of some of the different laces and kind of how they progressed because there's different, what they call grounds. So you can think of it as a background where they're even, where they're more open or not. So they have different shapes and there's different types of laces which use tapes or not. So tapes look like thin little ribbons or not. And um, nowadays, of course, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with, um, with bobbin lace. And like, here's a really cool one. This one is um, Pierre Pouchet down here. I don't know if you guys can see this. Look at how crazy this is. That's bobbin lace. That guy right there is rendered in lace, bobbin lace. And he uses a ton of different techniques in which to do it that he borrows from many different styles of bobbin lace. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just how lace has kind of uh, evolved throughout the years. But so next week, what I'm going to do is try to pull some examples and so I'll mark up my books. Um, 
not like actually mark them. I'll put sticky notes in them. I don't mark books. It's like antithesis to my Kelliness. Anyway, um, but we'll do a little bit more history stuff, but we'll compare some of them and I'll show you some of the differences between them. And they're really cool. There's some really neat things that you can see in lace. And then once we get through bobbin lace, um, we'll talk about some of the other laces. So I'll talk to you about, um, of course, tatting. And um, we'll do some of the crochet laces, like Irish crochet, which is one of the ones that, only ones that people really know. And we'll talk about like appliques and netting. And um, I want to talk about Mediterranean knotted lace. I need to practice again. And hopefully I can show you kind of how to do Mediterranean knotted lace because it's been a while since I've done it. So it would be really good for me to brush up on my skills. And then, uh, and then we'll kind of deep dive into lace knitting because I am teaching some classes if anyone is interested in um, lace knitting and I'm teaching, um, oh, I forget which one's first, but um, so I have my beginner knitting lace course, which is still going this week. And then I think next week I start my intermediate lace course. And then um, I think I go into Estonian lace first and then Shetland. I could be wrong about that. Um, because I just really love lace. I love lace and I love talking about it. And it's not like I can't teach other stuff too. I make cables and I make color work and I make all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, I'm going to teach a series of lace for the spring. And then we'll get into something else for the summer. So if there's a class that you'd really like me to teach, do let me know because I'm willing to put it on the books. Um, I do really, really enjoy teaching by Zoom. I, I'm really missing my people. Um, really missing my people. And, um, oh, you want to see some Battenberg lace? Oh yeah, I'll write that down. Yes, I will make sure that I have Battenberg lace for next week. Um, because that is uh, one of the um, bobbin laces, I do believe. I just have to find it. Um, might not be in this one. Well, then Tenerife is really interesting too. Tenerife is really interesting because you make it on a round like loom instead of making it. Well, anyway. I can't tell you all about lace in one little session. There's just too much of it to talk about. But yes, that one didn't have Battenberg. Where's my Battenberg? Let's go back here. Oh, and by the way, I bought this at Powell's Books. I bought this book at Powell's Books in 2014. And when I found the receipt, it kind of made me feel old. <laughs> it did. Like, it totally did. Yeah. There, Battenberg 144. Because Cheryl asked about it. Because I have the book right here in front of me, so why not look it up? Um, 144. Mm -mm -mm. Point lace. Well, that wasn't helpful. Battenberg. Yeah, 144. Am I on the wrong page? No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Australia Renaissance. Oh, here. Uh, point lace. Popular diversion of the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th. Uh, already been referred to on page 46. Okay. Under the name of Renaissance lace. Different designs carried names such as Point de, Point de Venise, Honiton Point, and Battenberg. So it's a style of point lace from page 46. Page 46. Oh, there we go. Renaissance lace. Ta-da! Ooh, pretty tape laces. I know. I'm just, I love looking at lace too, right? Look at the pretty laces. Look, so pretty. I know. I'm such a nerd when it comes to lace. But that's okay. We all have to love something, right? Oh, yeah. So, my back is really hurting. Um, I think it's time for another... I think it's time for another... Uh, yeah, I think it's time for another ibuprofen. But um, we're going to close out here. So, Cheryl, you missed this earlier. But look, I'm getting, a, getting my uh, sweater, like, mostly done. I have two sleeves. And I put the neckband on because my skeins are very different because I'm using the variegated ones that I are hand spun myself, right? So I did, this is like all one skein right here pretty much. 
um, this down into here. And then where it starts the turquoise, that's part of the second scan that I used on the sleeves. And then I'll get down into the orange for a third one once I run out. Um, yeah, yeah, Tamara. Those yoga stretches are not doing anything today, but uh, I don't know what you mean. Um, I honestly thought I was doing better, and like I mostly slept on my back last night. I tried to stay flat. I did not sleep very well um, because usually I start off on my side and then I roll to my back. So I start sleeping on my side and then I sleep on my back now. I used to always be like pretty much a pure side sleeper uh, until I got pregnant. And then because I was forced to sleep on my side for so long, then I became more of a back sleeper. <laughs> um, especially with, you know, the whole like breast milk thing and uh, yeah. So now I, I do sleep on my back more, but usually I start on the side and then I end up on my back. Um, so yes, my plan um, is pretty much to try to do a little bit of computer work, uh, keep working on the sweater, and try to fix my back um, for the rest of today. But hopefully you all will um, have a little fun and take some photos and share it on your social media so that we can search Black Sheep Fiber Emporium in the tags and it'll say, I'm working on my year of self-care project or whatever. And then uh, we can get you entered for the prizes at the end of the month. And please do tell your friends. Uh, and if you haven't already, make sure that you have liked our Facebook page, that you subscribe to the YouTube channel if that's where you find us. Um, you know, check out our TikTok channel. You can follow us there. You can follow us on Instagram. Uh, we're trying to be as socially, um, like, broad as possible so that no matter what kind of social media you like best, you can find us. And we do share things on all four of those channels pretty regularly um, throughout the week. So I'm, I always try to make sure that I put up my Facebook chats on the YouTube channel and... Um, I share a lot of little tutorials on the TikTok channel. Sometimes I turn those into YouTube videos and then they end up migrating to Facebook and Instagram as well um, because I do like to share my knowledge and everything that I have learned. So um, yeah, it's all kinds of fun here. Remember Wednesday, we're going to be doing weaving and um, I ordered, so don't, I'm gonna digress for a minute. So I ordered um, packing material because you have to have something to pack your warp with. And when I learned on my floor loom, we would cut paper bags, like grocery store paper bags, and use that to pack the warp. But I was watching um, Tammy Poff's videos on YouTube, which if you're getting into rigid huddle weaving, I found her videos to be very helpful because remember, weaving with Kelly on Wednesdays is a little bit of a let's find out how not to do things because it's been a while since Kelly did any weaving. I am not an authority on weaving. I'm just telling you what I'm learning as I'm going along and kind of sharing my information. So I'm not the authority and I could be doing things wrong. But I find Tammy Poff's videos to be really informative. And she's very bubbly, but she also had a glass of wine in the one video. I think we could be friends if I ever met this woman. I think I could friends with her. I would like to drink and weave as well, um, but I'm not quite there yet. Uh, anyway, one of the things that she used for warp packing material is actually the um, like squishy shelf liner. So I ordered some squishy shelf liner, uh, like a 10 foot roll of it that I'm going to cut because I need like 30 inch pieces because I ordered the 32 inch harp. So I need 30 inch pieces. 30 inches wide so that I can make sure that my because I put a warp on that's like 22 or 24 inches wide and your packing material has to be wider than your warp I was trying to figure out if that was true I thought I remembered that it's true if you're weaving on your if you're trying to get your warp ready to weave you need to make sure that your packing material is at least four inches wider on each end or something you know or goes all the way to the end of your apron rod if you are using the full width of your loom uh, so your packing material has to be wider than your warp. That's like the big thing. Your packing material has to be wider than your warp. <sighs> Got that out. Uh, so anyway, she was using this squishy, like, uh, 
yeah, shelf liner. And I thought, oh, that's a really interesting idea. I'd like to try that. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, I'm just going to line some shelves. Uh, so anyway, I'm hoping that it comes in time so that Wednesday we can put that in and pack the warp. And the reason we do that is because if you think about it, when you're winding your warp onto um, your back beam, then your threads will mesh together and they can get caught and stuck and you don't want that to happen. Uh, it also messes with your tension. So you want to put a layer of something in between them that's uh, not too slick and not too grabby so that um, your threads will uh, lie uh, in sheets instead of being all meshed together and stuck. So it makes perfect sense why you do it. That's why you do it. It's very important that you do it. Uh, and there are different um, things, like there's warping sticks that you can put in there. Um, and of course there's craft paper or brown paper bags from the grocery store, which, you know, I've used brown paper bags. I have nothing against them. It's just that I thought, oh, if I could just get these, you know, shelf liner pieces and cut them and just keep them in my kit, that's so much easier than uh, cutting out my paper bags every time I need to, you know, do the warping. And it's a lot harder to keep the paper bags too. I mean, like I said, I, I wove in the past, it's just been a long time. And I had a floor loom, so, you know, things were a little bit different. So I'm like relearning all of these things that I thought that I knew, but now I can't quite remember. Um, so that's what we do on Wednesdays. Weaving on Wednesdays and we're doing lots more lacy fun stuff on Mondays. And I will try to make sure that I put the event up and you know which part of lace uh, history we we're talking about on Mondays. So until Wednesday, when I'm back on here again, please take care of yourselves physically, emotionally, mentally, um, you know, craftually. I think I've said spiritually in the past, if that's what you need. Uh, you just need to take care of yourself. Uh, you're the only person that really knows exactly what your body needs and you have to listen to it because clearly I did not listen to mine. And that is why I have hurt my back yet again. So now I'm trying to listen to my body. <laughs> Pay attention. Uh, yeah, it's just not good. It's really not good. Um, but anyway, please take care of yourselves. And if you do go out, because I mean, most, most of the country is like under winter weather nastiness, so you're not going anywhere anyway. Uh, do please remember to put on your mask and physically distance and wash your hands and take care of yourself. I've had COVID. It was not a walk in the park. It was worse for me than any flu that I have ever had. And it lasted a lot longer. And then it came back and bit my butt later on by uh, making me smell exhaust fumes for three weeks. So you may not have what I had, but what I had sucked. So don't recommend it. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go sit down with my heating pack and a cup of coffee and one of the, um, what was it? Double gingerbread scones that I made with Ina recently. They're quite tasty. Never thought a gingerbread scone would be good, but it is. And there's even diced candied ginger in it. I really like ginger though. If you don't like gingerbread or ginger, you would hate these, but I think they're super tasty. So I'm going to go sit down with a scone and a cup of coffee on my heating pack, take an ibuprofen and try to get better. So. I will see you all on Wednesday. Please keep crafting and taking care of yourselves. And don't forget to share that year of self-care and whatever you're working on totally counts for year of self-care. So just share it and tag us. That way we can put you in the contest. So and we're just giving away a little something every month and we are definitely targeting it towards whatever crafting you like to do best. So if you're a quilter or a crocheter or a weaver, we're going to take care of you. It's not just for knitters and crocheters. So, you know. Cause I like to embroider too. I do some embroidery. I'm like, I'm this crazy needlework person. So anyway, I'll see you Wednesday. Take care of yourselves.